It's one second. One second, one second. Bienvenidos a España. Here we are. <laughs> we are now in Spain. Welcome. We'd been traveling in Portugal and crossed into Spain on a tour of the Iberian Peninsula. Our tour leader, Ana, was giving us her morning briefing. Here is uh, the western uh, most part of Spain and Extremadura, Extremo, Extremo border, because it is on the border with Portugal. And uh, this uh, city of Merida, we are going to visit, it is a very important, historically speaking, a very important city today. We came to a roundabout in Merida that contained the statue of the founder of what was a retirement community. It's not Del Webb, it's Caesar Augustus. After completing their service, Roman soldiers were given this amazing place to live. Entry to the city is via one of the world's longest surviving bridges from ancient time. Marida, founded in 25 BCE, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Our bus dropped us off so we could walk into town on the bridge. It was pedestrianized only 25 years ago after the completion of the nearby Lusitania Bridge designed by Santiago Calatrava. We looked back at the very old span and walked into the ancient Roman town. See the big arch uh -huh. and then the smaller arch. This was built because uh, when, it, when there are floods, floods, the water level rises. And so this small arch uh, kind of reduces the uh, erosion because the water can flow not only through the big arch but also through the small arch and the bridge is no longer such a such a strong ob obstacle to the water and for that reason it resists longer. We passed a statue of Romulus and Remus, symbol of ancient Rome, and proceeded further into town walking between ancient stone buildings. Then we came to a large plaza with a fountain and palm trees. There was a big clock tower at one end of the plaza. At its top was a huge nest that contained a family of storks. In Spain, most storks breed in a wide strip parallel to the border with Portugal. A migrating bird, it used to winter in sub-Saharan Africa and breed in Europe. But probably due to the relatively soft winters of the last few years, some birds are staying. In the past, storks arrived at the end of January and left in September. Originally called Augusta Emerita, the town name was transformed through time to Merida. Roman towns were known for their grid-style streets and this was no exception. On down the straight street through the town, we passed the modern shopping district. There were many temptations lurking inside the stores Beautiful women's wear filled one street front window. There were shops for the men too, and souvenirs of the Roman Empire to take home from the trip. But we were headed for the archaeological district of Merida, so passed on to an area of Roman ruins. that goes up, Cardos and Becumanos, 
and this is the forum. The forum, this is just one edge of the forum. The forum was huge and they just excavated a part of it. They found some of the original stones and you can see them over there, like the capitals, they are original, but the rest they just built it so that you can see the size of it. And it was around the forum that all the life of the town took place. So the shops, the uh, well, uh, political meetings, uh, all the gatherings took place in the forum or around the forum. So it was kind of the center of the, of the town. Statues are replicas. The original ones are in the museum. All of them are in the museum here in Merida. Uh, in we looked up at the modern homes with a view of the ancient forum, and then walk further down, passing the large modern museum built to house artifacts found in the ruins of this ancient city. Inside the entrance to the archaeological site, Anna bought our tickets as we looked at the wonderful display, helping us to understand what we would see beyond. There was a model of the amphitheater, completed in 8 BCE, and the theater completed in 15 BCE for the entertainment of the retired soldiers and their families. After a short break, we went into the archaeological site. This is the amphitheater. Amphitheater is basically the same as the Roman, uh, in Rome, the Colosseum. <coughs> The Colosseum is an amphitheater, a Roman amphitheater, so uh, kind of a gladiator movie, you know? So where they have the gladiator fights, the gladiator performances took place in this building, okay? This was not used for theater, just for amphitheater, which are two completely different things. And uh, this one here could fit 15,000 people, uh, spectators. Of course, a part of the uh, structure is in ruins, but we can still have a very good idea of the dimension of this. Uh, but the two arches on both sides, on this side is the same, it's like a double entrance. Uh, would be where the lions would come into the, the scene or uh, uh, a bull, a wild bull or a bear or whatever wild animals they would look for or a panther or uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but sometimes in the middle of the uh, show, you see on the middle there is a hole and this is covered with wood. This was a bit deeper than it is today and they could have also a surprise factor in hidden inside. So sometimes uh, they were in the middle of the arena, the gladiator, and they would like open like a catapult and there would be a lion popping out all of a sudden. Nice. So you imagine the surprise factor of all these. So it was something really like a show. This was the favorite show for the Roman times. Up some stairs we came to the entrance to the Roman theater. The reconstruction of the beautiful space is ongoing and dramatic. The columns stand proud, but its original statues have been moved to the museum. Several emperors had added to its magnificence, including Trajan and Constantine I. Following the theater's abandonment in late antiquity, it was slowly covered with earth. 
only the upper tiers of seats remaining visible. In local folklore, the site was referred to as the Seven Chairs, where, according to tradition, several Moorish kings sat to decide the fate of the city after the Islamic conquest of Spain. The Romans had been defeated here by the Visigoths in 476. The Goths ruled the area for almost 300 years till they were defeated here in 713 by the Moors. This gorgeous reconstructed theater has some seats replaced, so it can be used for modern theatrical and musical productions. This image from the internet along with this picture taken from above provide fabulous views of the restored facilities. We left the theater as it was now lunchtime. Directly across from the museum was a restaurant serving tapas and wine. Seated facing the museum, we scrutinized our menus and decided from a selection of remarkable choices. Olives were brought to us while we waited for our food. Out came the most delicious cream gazpacho soup. An appetizer was deep fried eggplant drizzled with local honey. Ever had quail eggs served over chorizo sausage? After all that, was there any room for the incredibly scrumptious salad with goat cheese? Lunch eaten, it was now time to visit the museum. Designed by architect Rafael Moneo, the museum was inaugurated in 1986. Its walls and arches are built of red brick, reminiscent of the ancient Roman buildings. Inside the museum is a map of the layout of the ancient city of Augusta Emerita. Right away the grid pattern is clear. The entertainment district is at one end of the completely walled city. The half mile long bridge we had walked led to what is surely a wonderful retirement community in ancient times. There were visuals to aid in our understanding of how things originally looked. Explanations about objects found were posted on the walls. We walked in through Roman style arches and down side aisles containing priceless artifacts. At the end of one room was a marble bust of Emperor Caesar Augustus, founder of Augusta Emerita. He was 39 years old when he ordered the city built. Over time, it became one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Modern-day Merida preserves more important ancient Roman monuments than any other city in Spain. This statue represents time, a circle encompassing the universe. The way drapery is carved in the pure white marble is fascinating. How did they do it? The folds look so real. There are many examples of ancient mosaic tile. Some are displayed on the wall so you can really make out their detail and the creativity of the artists. Other mosaics are displayed as they were found in rooms along with their fascinating frescoes. Images of gladiators were displayed beside a shield found in the ruins, and marble fragments of gladiators. One room had the head of a giant bull at its very end. Bulls continue to be cultural icons here, as bullfighting is performed in arenas to this day. 
At the end of the large room are the original statues and medallions from the Roman Forum where we began our tour of the city. Looking at these artifacts from over 2,000 years ago was a thrilling experience. We wish we had more time to explore the museum and learn more about ancient Augusta Emerita. But it was now time to leave the museum. Outside, we met the bus to continue traveling, now going south in Spain. The right, the Roman Bridge, and the skyline of Merida. I hope you enjoyed this town and visiting the Roman uh, structures, the Roman ruins. So today, uh, we are going to have a chance to do a siesta in the bus <laughs> because we are in Spain just just because <laughs> but uh, we have about a two and a half hour drive to get to the, the destination which is Carmona the star of Andalusia is the nickname of that town along the main avenue the check around the trees because of the mild climate they are now in full blossom Remember in Lisbon they were still starting, here they are in full blossom. Seated castle that's going to be your castle for the next two nights. Looks good? Yes. This is an internet picture of our lodging in Carmona in fabled Andalusia, a former castle converted to an exquisite parador.
We awoke in our 14th century castle turned parador. Going to the window seat, we saw that another perfect day lay ahead. Then down we went to breakfast. The courtyard area was completely empty. Spain's more of a nighttime place than a morning one. The fountain made its pleasant sound as we wandered into the sumptuous lounge area, decorated with red velvet and tapestry upholstered furniture. The morning light added its glow to the gorgeous room. Then we found our group, out on the castle's balcony, enjoying its panoramic view of Andalusia. Can you tell at this distance that many of the fields beyond the pool are sunflowers? Meal time arrived and we all trooped into the dining room to see what was for breakfast. We had a full day of touring ahead and wanted more sustenance. The Moorish style room had a long buffet that we set upon with enthusiasm. Iberian ham, sliced very thin, was snapped up. Cook dishes, including rice and eggs, were followed by a large variety of fruit. If you still had room, you could add a couple pieces of fruit bread. Large pots of coffee were served to us to satisfy our morning hunger. Then out we went to pass through the ancient stone gates and to board our bus. We drove away from our castle on its hill and then passed its city of Carmona. Uh, well, this was a Moorish town and the Moors, they built the Alcazar over there. The Alcazar of Carmona was such a pretty one that uh, it, even, it even kind of uh, had a rival, a rivality with the one in Seville. Both were very, very nice. It took about 30 minutes to drive from Carmona to the amazing city of Seville, capital of Andalusia. Seville was founded by the Romans, then conquered by the Visigoths who held it for 300 years. Next, the Moors had 700 years of occupation. Finally, Seville came under Catholic rule. Ferdinand Magellan, who was a teacher of navigation in this building, had his 1519 voyage, the first to circumnavigate the world, financed by the monarchs here in Seville. Practice, practice our Spanish uh, with Pablo. <laughs> uh, he's going to be our local guide, and I'm going to pass the microphone to him. He's going to tell us everything about this beautiful city. Nick, on the right hand side we have the bull ring of La Maestranza. This is one of the most important bull rings in our country, in Spain. The bull ring of La Maestranza on the right hand side. We drove past Seville's Plaza de Toros. It holds over 12,000 spectators and contains a theater box reserved for the exclusive use of the Spanish royal family. Bullfights usually go from March till September. Seville is filled with statues. We recognize the statue of El Cid, a military leader in Al Andalus. There's also one of the fictional character, Carmen. Her opera takes place in Seville. We stopped at the majestic Plaza de España, built for a 1929 exposition. The goal of the exposition was to increase the ties between hosts Spain and Portugal and their former colonies. Each country built a pavilion and they were built to last. This was Spain's pavilion. The Plaza de España has been used as a movie location, including scenes from the 1962 Lawrence of Arabia and the 2002 Star Wars Episode II Attack of the Clones. We passed a young woman making fabulous bubbles and walked beyond to the main building. There we found a moat with four beautiful and brightly painted tile bridges. 
These led to a promenade in front of a long pavilion. You can rent a boat for a leisurely row on the moat. Under the portico, we were thrilled to find buskers setting up to entertain visitors. These young people entertained us with flamenco. Flamenco is based on various folk traditions of southern Spain, particularly here in Andalusia. It's known for its emotional intensity, proud carriage, expressive use of the arms, and rhythmic stamping of the feet. Flamenco was influenced by the Moorish and Romani people in Spain. This style is uniquely Andalusian. UNESCO has declared flamenco a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. Ale. reluctantly left the flamenco as we wanted to go up to the second floor balcony for its sweeping view of the plaza and the fountain. Through one of its arches we could see why it would be chosen as a movie location. It's awesome! The pavilion mixes elements of Renaissance revival, Moorish revival, and Spanish style architecture. There's a colonnade around the front of the pavilion and the portico where the flamenco continued. As we came back down to the plaza, we passed vendors selling fans you could use if you decided to take up flamenco. In front of the main structure, we examined tile benches, completely covered with panels of allegorical paintings representing the 48 provinces of Spain. We were told they're often used as backdrops for a photo of a family from that province.
what a truly exquisite place. We walked away passing the colorful moat and looked back to see boaters going out for a row. Then we crossed the street and passed a group of vendors near the plaza and walked on through a huge park filled with trees and flowering bushes. We walked past a monument dedicated to Christopher Columbus and his epic voyage of 1492. Then into the old Barrio de Santa Cruz section of Seville, a labyrinth of homes, shops, narrow streets, and ancient city walls. It's no wonder that so many operas have their setting in Seville, known as the City of Opera. After free time to wander the narrow streets, we met under the old bell tower, originally a Moorish minaret. The old minaret is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and the most famous landmark in Seville. Our local guide Pablo pointed up to a crocodile at the entrance to the cathedral. It was sent as an exotic gift from the Sultan of Egypt to entice a marriage of his son with the princess. No marriage took place, but the croc was stuffed and hung for all to see. Then we entered the gigantic cathedral, third largest church in the world. We first encountered a side altar. It was covered with silver that had been brought back from the New World. There were huge stained glass windows surrounded by massive carvings. We were told the ceiling reaches 120 feet. Pablo took us to a side chapel filled with paintings by old masters, their religious subjects framed in solid gold. In this chapel was a stained glass window with the date of 1685, showing the minaret turned bell tower flanked by Catholic martyrs. Finally, we came to the great altar, the largest altarpiece in the world and a spectacular part of the interior. Pablo gave staggering statistics on the amount of its gold. 
we stuck our cameras through the grill. Its gold was blindingly bright. This astonishing altar, begun in 1482, took 44 years to complete. Cameras truly can't record the massive, brilliant, and detailed carvings. Next to the great altar is the main fascination of the cathedral, the remains of the great explorer, Christopher Columbus. He died in 1506 in poverty. In 1898, his remains were brought to Seville and placed in this magnificent tomb, carried by bearers representing the kingdoms of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and Navarre. In the floor is a plaque commemorating Columbus's epic voyage, where he changed everything by finding the new world. Columbus was born in Genoa, but his voyages were financed and he departed from Seville. That's why he's here. This morning's experiences had given us a big appetite for lunch. We were led to a pedestrianized street filled with cafes and entertainment venues. We stopped in front of a cafe specializing in seafood. This traditional neighborhood place was wonderfully decorated with charming old black and white photographs and colorful tiles. The tapas menu showed dogfish and cuttlefish, things we had never been offered before. 
We got some advice and then dove in. We were traveling for new experiences, food included. This lunch was not included in our tour, so we all figured out what we had ordered and searched our euros for the correct amount to pay our share. Completely content, we left the cafe and then had a last look at the former minaret at the far end of the street. Time to depart Seville and return to Carmona. We passed through small, beautiful plazas and then went under a long arcade to find our bus. It was parked next to a statue of Mozart, who wrote Marriage of Figaro and Don Giovanni, operas that are set in Seville. This part of Andalusia was covered with huge fields of sunflowers, creating an absolutely gorgeous drive through its countryside. Further on, we came into a mountainous area and to a perfect white village set high above a lake. Andalusia, that is Sahara de la Sierra, and uh, that's the name of the town that is perched on top of a hill 
with its castle, the tower of the castle on top of the of the mountain. So we are going to pass close to Sahara, but I believe this viewpoint over there is the best because you get the lake and the, and the town and the mountains. Our bus stopped next to a dam on the Guadalquivir River. It created a lake and a matchless view of the hillside beyond, a fabulous panorama of the flawless village of Zahara. The town was originally a Moorish outpost. The Muslims departed in 1407, but remains of the Moorish castle still exist. This was certainly a photo to take home and share. We passed the Big Blue Lake and continued through the mountains. We were on our way to another exquisite place, the city of Ronda in the province of Malaga. Here you can see over there on the right, that is the bullfight ring, the oldest bull ring in Spain. Our Parador is located right next to the bridge that connects the two parts or the two sides of Ronda. Well, we are not checking in right now because the rooms are ready only after two o'clock. So we are going to um, arrive, they are going to take out our bags and leave them uh, in the reception stored as well as our carry-ons and then uh, we should be back to the hotel at two o'clock to do the check-in. Okay? We pulled up right in front of our parador located next to the bridge that connects the two parts of Ronda. The round circle in this photo is the bullring that we just passed. Can you see the deep ravine with the bridge across and the courtyard just above the bridge? That building to the left with the blue swimming pool is our Parador in Ronda. We left our bus and instead of heading for the bridge, we turned around and walked back toward the large white bullring. There were statues of matadors in front. We took a couple pictures, of course, but again, we didn't go over to the statues. Instead, we turned and entered a restaurant directly across from the bullring. Named Pedro Romero, this restaurant honors a legendary bullfighter from Ronda. His bus sits in the entry. His cape and hat are displayed there too. Romero fought the bulls until retiring in 1824 at the age of 80 a real legend. This place is a tribute to matadors and the corrida, or bullfight. Huge stuffed bullheads hung above us in the picture-filled dining room. Here they specialize in soup, so we ordered up some bowls of garlic soup, gazpacho, and sangria, and then gazed around at the heads, posters, and pictures. Most of the matadors in the photos were young, not many 80-year-olds in sight. Matador de Toros literally means killer of bulls. Considered performance art in Spain, it requires great agility, grace, coordination, and bravery. After lunch, we walked back to our parador next to the ravine and bridge. Time to check in. This was a very different parador than we'd had before. While it had another dramatic setting, this was the refurbished former town hall of Ronda. A 
Up in our room, we excitedly walked to our small private balcony. It overlooked the garden in a walkway that hugs the edge of the ravine. After settling in and using the facilities, we rejoined our group in the lobby. Out under the modern red framework overhead, we now enthusiastically went out to get a good look at our parador and the ravine. Sensational! Crossing over, we got the view of the parador, the bridge, and the 390-foot chasm. How's that for a dramatic setting? Replacing a former span, this one is called the new bridge. Completed in 1793, it took 34 years to build. Further down the length of the ravine, there are two smaller bridges, homes, restaurants, and hotels taking advantage of the unique panorama. We left the overlook and walked on down the main road. We had an appointment with a local guide. Ramon gathered us under the shade of a tree, as it was about 80 degrees on this afternoon. Then Ramon led us while telling some of the history of the town. It's been inhabited since the Neolithic age by the Celts. Of course the Romans were here. They gave it the name Ronda at the time of Julius Caesar. Then the Visigoths captured the city. Yes, then the Moors, the Muslims from North Africa. Islamic domination ended in 1485 when it was conquered by the Catholic Marquis of Cadiz. Some Moorish buildings remain, like this mansion with its twin towers. Ramon pointed out some of the ancient Moorish walls, crumbling after so many turbulent years. Their mortar had turned to sand. Most of this old area is beautifully maintained, especially near this old Moorish minaret. It was built in the 1200s. You got it, it was converted to a Catholic bell tower. On through town we went. Ramon pointed out if there's a crest over the door, it is or was occupied by nobility. This door was open, so we went in to find a cool courtyard with an old fountain, also with a noble crest. Quiet now, this courtyard must have been a wonderful haven on a hot Spanish day. This oldest section of Ronda had so many great old buildings. One with its relatively newer construction date on the lintel, 1738. Being so ancient, luckily some of the old town walls are still intact. We walked to them to see the view. These walls, originally from the Moorish time, built in the 1100s, were fortified after the Catholics replaced the Moors. Linda went up to get a picture of this gorgeous panoramic view of the town. Linda and I had separated. She had gone with our group to climb the old town wall while I went across to get a different aspect. Stairs, no problem for our intrepid group. We climbed everywhere if it meant the great experience of seeing a fabulous view, especially from on top of old Moorish town walls. We continued through town passing the College of Santa Maria la Mayor, begun in 1530. It was the first Renaissance church to be built in Malaga. The school's most distinguished teacher was Pedro Espinoza. Then we passed more beautiful homes and under red geraniums cascading from their black wrought iron window boxes. There were also orange trees snuggled against the pure white walls. You can't go far in Ronda without a magnificent view. Down to a Spanish flower garden with its perfect fountain, we came to the other end of the deep ravine where our parador sat across the divide. 
we relaxed in the exquisite flower-laden garden overlooking Malaga and the majestic aspect of Ronda and its bridge. Back up to street level, we thought our afternoon walk was ending. Then, just before the bridge, we stopped. Anna told us we were going to have a learning and discovery. We went into a shop to learn about Iberian ham. Because it's an animal that lives semi-wild. Okay, it's an animal that keeps his life, you know, trying to find acres under the trees. So he keeps walking and walking. So it's the muscle, the muscle is totally, totally uh, uh, mixed with the, uh, with the fat. So it's a good fat. The label comes off first. Look, look at that. This is, you know how much it worth this, this thing? A lot. No, how much? It's about 250 euros. 250 euros? Yeah. For the whole thing? For the whole thing. Do people buy the whole thing? Oh, yeah. Price? yeah. And my my and discovery budget is not so high. <laughs> <laughs> this is the pigs. Oh, yeah, there's the foot. That's one of the four foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the back foot. Yeah. Another thing that I have to tell you this thing is being curing for approximately three years and a half. This cheese, the cheese doesn't come from the pig, all right? I like the cheese. She's good cutting cheese. Another thing. <laughs> and it's a job, it's a profession, you know, a profession. The slice needs to be very, very thin, nearly transparent. The process is as follows. You know, you kill the pig, okay, and you put the leg into salt for a while, but not very much. About, I would say, uh, three weeks, four weeks. You start with the ham. Okay, then you have a cookie and then you have the cheese. This is the recommended order because the cheese is stronger. The ham with the fat, that's the best part. That's where the flavor is. Ham, yeah. ham, cookie, and cheese. This is the best, the best order. Is it kosher? Okay. After our Iberian ham experience, we went back over the bridge and returned to our parador. The bar sits right next to the ridge walkway. A couple of us decided that this was a great time for a relaxing drink with the magnificent view. What else? Sangria in Spain, celebrating our fabulous tour together. Later, Anna asked if anyone wanted to take an evening walk into another part of town. A few of us went with Anna for a quiet stroll in the countryside, beneath the city walls that we had climbed.
The dining room overlooked a large gazebo with a jutting platform. Out after dinner, we went to stand on it and get its magnificent view. Just below the platform, musicians were setting up for a free concert. Some of us joked around as we waited for the concert to begin, emphasizing the difference in our heights. We watched a performance of techno music. Then we realized we wanted to get over to the first bullring in Spain. We went to the famous Plaza de Toros. Rondos was completed in 1785. Soon after, the local Romero family began its bullfighting dynasty. There is a plaque honoring Pedro Romero. We learned about him at our lunch across from the bullring. In his long career, Pedro had invented the classical style of bullfighting here in Ronda. We walked across the street to a hotel that had a bar that overlooks the bullring. Two levels provide seating for 5,000 spectators. Does it remind you of an ancient Roman amphitheater or a modern football arena? Rondas was the first purpose-built bullring to stage a corrida. The fighting team consists of one matador, two picadors on horseback with lances, and three bandilleros who plant large ribbon darts. There's also a sword servant and one or two other helpers. The corrida has three phases, with the matador taking center stage for the ritual kill. After the kill, the bull is taken to a slaughterhouse. As dark approached, we went down to take a look at the matador statues out front. The lights had just come on as we came to the two figures in their iconic poses. Famous sons of Ronda, they are idols here. The equivalent of gladiators and football heroes. We are passionate about getting great photographs. Up early, we went downstairs as the town definitely fed our passion. We wanted the morning light on the bridge. So worth getting up for. We could see the garden where we had rested on our walk the previous day, clinging to the side of the chasm. Van stayed at the ridge walkway and I went over the bridge, our normal divide and conquer technique. The town was quiet, only one other person apparent. Which superlative do you choose to say about this place? When I returned, I found Van, reflecting on our great good fortune to be able to have these experiences. Going back inside, we headed for breakfast on this marvelous morning. Thank you. 
After breakfast, our group got on our bus, and then we drove out of Rhonda, passing vast groves of olive trees. We headed for a Spanish hacienda. Yes, that circle in the photo is a bull ring, and it belongs to a matador. Did you know the word arena is derived from the Latin for the sand used in ancient amphitheaters for gladiator fights? Our group posed in front of this arena for a great picture of our group in Spain. Then we went inside a nearby building. It held models of arenas. There was one of the bull ring we had driven past in Seville. There was also a model of the ring in Ronda. It held tiny matadors and their teams. They were performing the ritual opening parade of a corrida. The building's walls were covered with posters announcing former corridas and listing the owner of this ranch. Back outside, we were introduced to one of the ranch workers, Pablo. Pa Pablo, he is uh, El Curro, which is the, the person responsible for taking care of the farm, of the animals, doing all the, the work here. And, uh, well, he's going to show us uh, how uh, are his activities during the morning. What does he do as, uh, as uh, the Curro here in the Reserva Tauro? Pablo took us over to see some horses across the way by a stone wall. Is, the one on the left is a picador horse. Ah, okay. Normalmente 20, hey, and 20 years normally. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, Thanks they can work as picador horses. Yeah, because they are protected. They are we are well going protected. to see okay. the, the, the leather they what use. Is? We left the horses and walked over to the barn. Inside was a mannequin wearing a padded leather covering and blinders for a picador horse. This padding protects the horse from the horns of the bull. The picador gets next to the bull and then thrusts a lance into its neck during the first stage of the bullfight. Then we came to a series of beautiful horses in their stalls. What's his name? ¿Cómo se llama? Este. ¿Cómo? Evalo. 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 Oh, Evalo. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to These horses are different from the Pecador horse. Yes. Pecador. Yes. What are these horses used for? These are used to practice with the bulls. They practice. Yes. Yes, he does. They have been together. Excuse me. It's like the child that screams, though. It's yeah. also what they're doing is making it reinforcing worse. Reinforcing the behavior. After feeding the gorgeous horses, we went to find the bulls. This ranch breeds and sells horses and bulls for bullfights. Another ranch worker, Francisco, wrangled some of the massive bulls, worth between nine and twelve thousand dollars. Look at the size of those horns! Bulls may weigh up to two thousand pounds. That's a ton of bull wanting to charge when it feels provoked. They were massive and beautiful. Their hides glistened. These extremely valuable animals are farm fed and their meat is often sold as organic beef after a bullfight. Okay, it says, uh, it's like this. If they are in an open field and they are comfortable, they will probably run away from you. If they are uh, having some kind of problem or pain, they probably, like irritated, they will probably charge to you. Oh. Or if they are in an enclosure, they will charge to you or to whatever new mm -hmm. comes inside. The bulls take turns breeding with cows also raised on the ranch. We took our pictures of the massive bulls and then went to find the breeding cows 
they were kept in a separate corral. So next year, uh, el, 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 el negro, el negro. The next year is going to be the black one. So they I never saw it so close. Sí, es está acostumbrada de chiquitita. Sí. Hemos criado con un bebé. Sí. Oh, they they had to feed her with um, a bottle when she was little. So she is very friendly. She comes close because of that. She's hoping for more food. I think so. Yeah. Those others are shy, though. They're staying back. <laughs> you eat food. Good. Yep. Okay. So uh, when they have to move them from one to the other, they take her with the bell, and they all follow her. Like uh -huh. As we left the breeding cows, the matador came to greet us. He's a 44-year-old Spaniard and began fighting bulls in 2008. This is Rafael Tejada, the owner of this uh, farm. How old were you when you started training? I, well, my, my, my case is very special because I started later than a bullfighter because I went first to the university. I had the vocation since I was a child, but I couldn't do it. And in 2008, when I was 74 years old, the vocation was very strong and I felt in this moment I had to change my life. Um, I started to train in this moment. Yeah. And your family was also first? No, no, I'm the first. You're the first? Yes. How many parts have you been? Around 100. Oh, wow. And how long do you think you It depends on oh. the mine. The mine is the best weapon. The no, but it's not more important. Oh, no, of course, the body is necessary, but it's more important than mine. The there are bullfighters when they are 30, they can continue because their minds are not. And there was bullfighter with 68 years old. Wow. Yes, and last year, the Cordobes, do you know El Cordobes? Yeah. El Cordobes was fighting one day for charity in Cordoba and he was more than 75. Wow. wow. Did he win? Yes. Uh, the audience win when a bull and a man can understand together. But no, no, no win the bullfighter because he's alive and the bull is dead. Do you do any other kind of physical training or just practicing? No, I have to do a lot of physical exercise. I, I have to do uh, running, cardio, gym. Depend on the day. No? Mm -hmm. The matador has a team, and in this team there are three banderilleros who help the matador if he has an accident with the bull, and two picadors who uh, do uh, the the job to prove how brave is the bull with the with the horse. No? With the picador, no? So you do that in the beginning of the bullfight also. You you spear the bull. No, no, me no. I'm a matador. Not you. I no. mean the your, your. I have a, a picador in my team. Yeah, picador. They will do the it. The bullfighting. In the first moment when the bull comes to the arena, I have to um, fight with the pink eye, with the capote. Oh, you, you can see that there. And then when I finish with the cave, comes the the picador. The picador. Okay. And when the picadors finish, they start the banderilleros, and at the end I have to, to, to fight with a, a red cape. Okay, okay. Well, at the end then you yeah. do that. And are you yeah. alone in the yeah. arena then? Yes, yes. At the end. Yes. And how long will that take, that part? Around 20 minutes. Where you're alone in the arena? When year? I am, I'm alone uh, between 10 and 15. Wow. To, wow. to kill the bull. Yes. And do you have scars from where yes, the bull has yeah. licked you? Yes, it's yeah. impossible not to be injured. Right, have, right. I have broken bones. I have this. Ooh, oh, wow. wow. Rafael showed us a huge scar in his groin. This internet picture shows him in the hospital recovering from his 12 inch wound. In his second year of fighting, he was caught by the horn of a bull and tossed into the air. He made a full recovery and continues in his bullfighting career. 
We went back into the barn to examine Raphael's actual fighting capes. Then we were surprised when Raphael returned. What is your next full fight, you know? Uh, I'm waiting a new day because the last one was cancelled by the rain. And now I'm waiting the new day. No day. In Carmona? No. Do you ever go outside? Yes, I went to Mexico too. So, what is the, you, you used this before you used the red one? Yes. I use this one because the wood is powerful in this model because it has a lot of strong energy and this cave is here and you can protect you if I don't move in the cave right. than the other one. It's easy, no? It's easy, no? It's easy. It's easy. It's easy for you. So, wrapping up. When you got this, this, tell us what happened. My team, uh, bring me to the doctor. No, no, no. Why? Why? Because I was very sick. Okay. Yeah. Why? Because I was sick. 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 Why? When do you know, when do you decide, and do you decide to use the red cape? When? Uh, it, it's a process, and always it's the same process, no? Uh, you have a time to, to stop the bull with this. Okay, then come the picador, then the, the banderilleros, and when the banderilleros finish, you have to start with the red cake. Okay, so, so the process. Yes. And when, did you, when do you decide, at what moment do you decide to, to go with it? It's depend on the bull. When the bull decides it's better you, attack the men than the cage, is the moment. And each bull is different. So you want to put the sword in? In a, behi behind the big muscle, behind the neck. A little point where if you put the sword, the bull die quickly. <laughs> okay. You don't want to latch? <laughs> 